Act One of The Boers by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Boers. Les Fachos. Dramatis Personi. Noyad. Read by Lian Yao. Erast. In Love with Orphis. Read by Thomas Peter. Damis, guardian to Orphis, read by Rob Board. Lysandra, a boar, read by Son of the Exiles. Alcandre, a boar, read by Sandra Schmidt. Al Sheep, a boar, read by Alan Mapstone. Dorant, a boar, read by Nima. Garidides, a boar. Read by Larry Wilson. Or man, a boar. Read by Roger Moline. Philant, a boar. Read by Travis Mader. La Montaigne, servant to Erast. Read by Todd. Lapine, servant to Damis. Read by Chuck Williamson. La Riviere. Read by Joseph Tabler. Orphis in love with Rust, read by T. J. Burns. Orant, a female boar, read by Sonia. Clemen, a female boar, read by Eva Davis. Stage directions, read by April Walters. Introductory notice: Moliere dedicated the boars to Louis XIV in the following words: "Sire, I am adding one scene to the comedy." and a man who dedicates a book is a species of bore insupportable enough. Your Majesty is better acquainted with this than any person in the kingdom, and this is not the first time that you have been exposed to the fury of epistles dedicatory. But though I follow the example of others, and put myself in the rank of those I have ridiculed, I dare, however, assure Your Majesty that what I have done in this case is not so much to present you a book as to have the opportunity of returning your thanks for the success of this comedy. I owe, sire, that success which exceeded my expectations not only to the glorious approbation with which your majesty honored this piece at first and which attracted so powerfully that of all the world but also to the idea which you gave to me to add a boar of which yourself had the goodness to give me the idea and which was proved by every one to be the finest part of the work i must confess sire i never did anything with such ease and readiness as that part where i had your majesty's commands to work the pleasure I had in obeying them was to me more than Apollo and all the muses, and by this I conceive what I should be able to execute in a complete comedy were I inspired by the same commands. Those who are born in an elevated rank may propose to themselves the honor of serving your majesty in great employments, but, for my part, all the glory I can aspire to is to amuse you. The ambition of my wishes is confined to this, and I think that, to contribute anything to the diversion of her king is, in some respects, not to be useless to France. Should I not succeed in this, it shall never be through want of zeal or study, but only through a hapless destiny, which often accompanies the best intentions, and which, to a certainty, would be a most sensible affliction to sire. Your Majesty's most humble, most obedient, and most faithful servant, Moliere. Prologue the theatre represents a garden adorned with termini and several fountains, a naiad coming out of the water in a shell. Mortals, from grots profound I visit you, Gallia's great monarch in these scenes to view. Shall earth's wide circuit, or the wider seas, produce some novel sight your prince to please? Speak he, or wish, to him naught can be hard, whom as a living miracle you all regard fertile in miracles his reign demands wonders at universal nature's hands sage young victorious valiant and august mild as severe and powerful as he's just his passions and his foes alike to foil and noblest pleasures join to noblest toil his righteous projects ne'er to misapply hear and see all and act incessantly he who can this can all he needs but dare and heaven in nothing will refuse his prayer let lewis but command 
these bounds shall move and trees grow vocal as dodonas grow ye nymphs and demigods whose presence fills their sacred trunks come forth so lewis wills to please and be our task i lead the way quit now your ancient forms but for a day with borrowed shape cheat the spectator's eye and to theatric art yourselves apply several dryads accompanied by fawns and satyrs come forth out of the trees and termini hence royal cares hence anxious application his favourite work to bless a happy nation his lofty mind permit him to unbend and to a short diversion condescend the morn shall see him with redoubled force resume the burthen and pursue his course give force to laws his royal bounty share wisely prevent all wishes with his care contending lands to union firm dispose and lose his own to fix the world's repose but now let all conspire to ease the pressure of royalty by elegance of pleasure impertinence avant nor come in sight unless to give him more supreme delight the naiad brings with her for the play one part of the persons she has summoned to appear whilst the rest begin a dance to the sound of hoboy accompanied by violins act one scene one erast la montagne good heavens under what star am i born to be perpetually worried by bores it seems that fate throws them in my way everywhere each day i discover some new specimen but there is nothing to equal my bore of to-day i thought i should never get rid of him a hundred times i cursed the harmless desire which seized me at dinner-time to see the play where thinking to amuse myself i unhappily was sorely punished for my sins i must tell you how it happened for i cannot yet think about it coolly i was on the stage in a mood to listen to the piece which i had heard praised by so many the actors began every one kept silence when with a good deal of noise and in a ridiculous manner a man with large rolls entered abruptly crying out hello there a seat directly and disturbing the audience with his uproar interrupted the play in its finest passage heavens the frenchmen although so often corrected never behave themselves like men of common sense must we in a public theatre show ourselves with our worst faults and so confirm by our foolish outbursts what our neighbours everywhere say of us thus i spoke and whilst i was shrugging my shoulders the actors attempted to continue their parts but the man made a fresh disturbance in seating himself and again crossing the stage with long strides although he might have been quite comfortable at the wings he planted his chair full in front and defying the audience by his broad back hid the actors from three-fourths of the pit a murmur arose at which any one else would have felt ashamed but he firm and resolute took no notice of it and would have remained just as he had placed himself if to my misfortune he had not cast his eyes on me ah marquis he said taking a seat near me how dost thou do let me embrace thee immediately my face was covered with blushes that people should see i was acquainted with such a giddy fellow i was but slightly known to him for all that but so it is with these men who assume an acquaintance on nothing whose embraces we are obliged to endure when we meet them and who are so familiar with us as to thou and thee us he began by asking me a hundred frivolous questions raising his voice higher than the actors every one was cursing him and in order to check him i said i should like to listen to the play hast thou not seen it marquis oh on my soul i think it very funny and i am no fool in these matters i know the canons of perfection and corneille reads me all that he writes thereupon he gave me a summary of the piece informing me scene after scene of what was about to happen 
and when we came to any lines which he knew by heart, he recited them aloud before the actor could say them. It was in vain for me to resist. He continued his recitations, and towards the end rose a good while before the rest. For these fashionable fellows, in order to behave gallantly, especially avoid listening to the conclusion. I thanked heaven, and naturally thought that, with a comedy, my misery was ended. But as though this were too good to be expected, my gentleman fastened on me again, recounted his exploits, his uncommon virtues, spoke of his horses, of his love affairs, of his influence at court, and heartily offered me his services. I politely bowed my thanks, all the time devising some way of escape, but he, seeing me eager to depart, said, Let us leave, every one is gone. And when we were outside, he prevented me going away by saying, Marquis, let us go to the cour to show my carriage. It is very well built, and more than one duke and peer has ordered a similar one for my coachmaker. I thanked him, and the better to get off, told him that I was about to give a little entertainment. Ah, on my life, I shall join it as one of your friends, and give the go-by to the marshal to whom I was engaged. My banquet, I said, is too slight for gentlemen of your rank. Nay, he replied, I am a man of no ceremony, and I go simply to have a chat with thee. I vow I am tired of grand entertainments. But if you are expected, you will give offence if you stay away. Thou art joking, Marquis. We all know each other. I pass my time with thee much more pleasantly. I was chiding myself, sad and perplexed at heart at the unlucky result of my excuse, and knew not what to do next to get rid of such a mortal annoyance when a splendidly built coach, crowded with footmen before and behind, stopped in front of us with a great clatter, from which leaped forth a young man gorgeously dressed, and my boar and he, hastening to embrace each other, surprised the passers-by with their furious encounter. Whilst both were plunged in these fits of civilities, I quietly made my exit without a word, not before I had long groaned under such a martyrdom cursing this boar whose obstinate persistence kept me from the appointment which had been made with me here these annoyances are mingled with the pleasures of life all goes not sir exactly as we wish it heaven wills that here below every one should meet boars without that men would be too happy but of all my boars the greatest is dummy guardian of her whom i adore who dashes every hope she raises and has brought it to pass that she dares not see me in his presence i fear i have already passed the hour agreed on it is in this walk that our feast promised to be the time of an appointment has generally some latitude and is not limited to a second true but i tremble my great passion makes out of nothing a crime against her whom I love. If this perfect love, which you manifest so well, makes out of nothing a great crime against her whom you love, the pure flame which her heart feels for you, on the other hand, converts all your crimes into nothing. But, in good earnest, do you believe that I am loved by her? What? Do you still doubt a love that has been tried? Ah, uh, it is with difficulty that a heart that truly loves has complete confidence in such a matter. It fears to flatter itself, and, amidst its various cares, what it most wishes is what it least believes. But let us endeavour to discover the delightful creature. Sir, your necktie is loosened in front. No matter let me adjust it if you please uh, you are choking me blockhead let it be as it is let me just comb was there ever such stupidity you have almost taken off my ear with the tooth of the comb your rolls leave them you are too particular they are quite rumpled i wish them to be so at least allow me as a special favour to brush your hat, which is covered with dust. Brush, then, since it must be so. Will you wear it like that? Good heavens, make haste! 
It would be a shame. Erast, after waiting. That is enough. Have a little patience. He will be the death of me. Where could you get all this dirt? Do you intend to keep that hat forever? It is finished. Give it me, then. The Montaigne, letting the hat fall. Ah. There it is on the ground. <sighs> I am not much the better for all your brushing. Plague take you. Let me give it a couple of rubs to take off. You shall not. The deuce take every servant who dogs your heels, who wearies his master, and does nothing but annoy him by wanting to set himself up as indispensable. Scene 2. Orphes, Alcidor, Erast, La Montagne. Orphes passes at the foot of the stage. Alcidor holds her hand. But do I not see Orphes? Yes, it is she who comes. Whither goeth she so fast? And what man is that who holds her hand? He bows to her as she passes, and she turns her head another way. Scene 3. Erast, La Montagne. What? She sees me here before her, and she passes by, pretending not to know me. What can I think? What do you say? Speak, if you will. Sir, I say nothing, lest I bore you. And so indeed you do, if you say nothing to me whilst I suffer such a cruel martyrdom. Give me some answer. I am quite dejected. What am I to think? Say, what do you think of it? Tell me your opinion. Sir, I desire to hold my tongue, and not to set up for being indispensable. Hang the impertinent fellow. Go and follow them, see what becomes of them, and do not quit them. La Montaigne, returning. Shall I follow at a distance? Yes. La Montaigne, returning. Without their seeing me, or letting it appear that I was sent after them? No, you will do much better to let them know that you follow them by my express orders. La Montaigne, returning. Shall I find you here? Plague take you. I declare you are the biggest bore in the world. Scene 4. Erast Alone Ah, oh, how anxious I feel. How I wish I had missed this fatal appointment. I thought I should find everything favorable. And instead of that, my heart is tortured. Scene 5. Lysandra Erast I recognize you from under these trees from a distance, dear Marquis and i came to you at once as one of my friends i must sing you a certain air which i have made for a little curanto which pleases all the connoisseurs that court and to which more than a score of already written words i have wealth birth a tolerable employment and am of some consequence in france but I would not have failed for all I am worth to compose this air which I am going to let you hear. Listen attentively, I beg. He sings an air of a coranto. Oh, is it not fine? Ah. This clothes is pretty. He sings the clothes over again four or five times successively. How do you like it? Very fine indeed. Oh, the steps which I have arranged are no less pleasing. And the figure in particular is wonderfully graceful. He sings the words, talks and dances at the same time, and makes Arast perform the lady's steps. Stay, the gentleman crosses thus. Then the lady crosses again. Together, then they separate. And the lady comes there. Do you observe the little touch of a faint? This fleure? These coupés running after the fair one? Back to back? Face to face? Pressing up close to her? After finishing? What do you think of it, Marquis? 
all those steps are fine for my part i would not give a fig for your ballet masters evidently and the steps then are wonderful in every particular shall i teach you them for friendship's sake to tell the truth just now i am somewhat disturbed well then it shall be when you please if i had these new words about me we would read them together and see which were the prettiest another time farewell my dearest baptiste has not seen my curato i am going to look for him we always agree about the tunes i shall ask him to score it exit still singing scene six erast alone heavens must we be compelled daily to endure a hundred fools because they are men of rank and must we in our politeness demean ourselves so often to applaud when they annoy us scene seven erast la montagne sir Orifice is alone, and is coming this way. Ah, oh, I feel myself greatly disturbed. I still love the cruel fair one, and my reason bids me hate her. Sir, your reason knows not what it would be at, nor yet what power a mistress has over a man's heart. Whatever just cause we may have to be angry with a fair lady, she can set many things to right by a single word alas i must confess it the sight of her inspires me with respect instead of with anger scene eight orphes erast la montagne your countenance seems to me anything but cheerful can it be my presence erast which annoys you what is the matter what is amiss what makes you heave those sighs at my appearance alas can you ask me cruel one what makes me so sad and what will kill me is it not malicious to feign ignorance of what you have done to me the gentleman whose conversation made you pass me just now <laughs> does that disturb you do cruel one and you insult my misfortune certainly it ill becomes you to jeer at my grief and by outraging my feelings ungrateful woman to take advantage of my weakness for you i really must laugh and declare that you are very silly to trouble yourself thus the man of whom you speak far from being able to please me is a bore of whom i have succeeded in ridding myself one of those troublesome and officious fools who will not suffer a lady to be anywhere alone but come up at once with soft speech offering you a hand against which one rebels i pretended to be going away in order to hide my intention and he gave me his hand as far as my coach i soon got rid of him in that way and returned by another gate to come to you orphis can i believe what you say and is your heart really true to me you are most kind to speak thus when i justify myself against your frivolous complaints i am still wonderfully simple and my foolish kindness ah huh. too severe beauty do not be angry being under your sway i will implicitly believe whatever you are kind enough to tell me deceive your hapless lover if you will i shall respect you to the last gasp abuse my love refute me yours show me another lover triumphant yes i will endure everything for your divine charms i shall die but even then i will not complain as such sentiments rule your heart i shall know on my side scene nine alcandre orphes erast la montagne alcandre to orphes marquis one word madame i pray you to pardon me if i am indiscreet in venturing before you to speak with him privately exit orphes scene ten alcandre erast la montagne 
I have a difficulty, Marquis, in making my request, but a fellow has just insulted me, and I earnestly wish, not to be behind hand with him, that you would at once go and carry him a challenge from me. You know that in a like case I would joyfully repay you in the same coin. Erast, after a brief silence. I have no desire to boast, but I was a soldier before I was a courtier. I served fourteen years, and I think I may fairly refrain from such a step with propriety, not fearing that the refusal of my sword can be imputed to cowardice. A duel puts one in an awkward light, and our king is not the mere shadow of a monarch. He knows how to make the highest in the state obey him, and I think that he acts like a wise prince. When he needs my service, I have courage enough to perform it, but I have none to displease him. His commands are a supreme law to me. Seek someone else to disobey him. I speak to you, Viscount, with entire frankness. In every other matter I am at your service. Farewell. Scene 11. Erast La Montagne. To the deuce with these boars, fifty times over. Where now has my beloved gone to? I know not. Go and search everywhere till you find her. I shall await you in this walk. Ballet to Act One. First entry. Players at Mall crying out where compel Eras to draw back. After the players at Mall have finished, Eras returns to wait for our fees. Second entry. Inquisitive folk advance, turning round him to see who he is and cause him again to retire for a little while. End of Act One. Act Two of The Boars by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Scene One. Erast, alone. Are the boys gone at last? I think they reign here on every side. The more I flee from them, the more I light on them. And to add to my uneasiness, I cannot find her whom I wish to find. The thunder and rain have soon passed over, and have not dispersed the fashionable company. Would to heaven that those gifts which had showered upon us had driven away all the people who weary me. The sun sinks fast. I am surprised that my servant has not yet returned. Scene 2. Alcip, Erast. Good day to you. Erast, aside. How now? Is my passion always to be turned aside? Console me, Marquis. In respect of a wonderful game of piquet, which I lost yesterday to a certain Saint-Bouvin, to whom I could have given fifteen points and the deal. It was a desperate blow, which has been too much for me since yesterday, and would make me wish all players at the deuce. A blow, I assure you, enough to make me hang myself in public. I wanted only two tricks. The other wanted a piquet. I dealt. He takes six and asks for another deal. I, having a little of everything, refuse. I had the ace of clubs, fancy my bad luck. The ace, king, knave, ten, and eight of hearts. And as I wanted to make the point, threw away king and queen of diamonds, ten and queen of spades. I had five hearts in hand and took up the queen, which just made me a high sequence of five. But my gentleman, to my extreme surprise, lays down on the table a sequence of six low diamonds, together with the ace. I had thrown away king and queen of the same colour. But, 
as he wanted a piquet i got the better of my fear and was confident at least of making two tricks besides the seven diamonds he had four spades and playing the smallest of them put me in the predicament of not knowing which of my two aces to keep i threw away rightly as i thought the ace of hearts but he had discarded four clubs and i found myself made capot by a six of hearts unable from sheer vexation to say a single word by heaven account to me for this frightful piece of luck could it be credited without having seen it it is in play that luck is mostly seen it's death you shall judge for yourself if i am wrong and if it is without cause that this accident enrages me for here are our two hands which i carry about with me on purpose stay here is my hand as i told you and here i understand everything from your description and admit that you have a good cause to be enraged but i must leave you on a certain business farewell but take comfort in your misfortune who i i shall always have that luck on my mind it is worse than a thunderbolt to me i mean to show it to all the world he retires and on the point of returning says meditatively a six of hearts two points where in the world are we go where we will we see nothing but fools scene three arrast la montagne ha how long you have been and how you have made me suffer sir i could not make greater haste but at length do you bring me some news doubtless and by express command from her you love i have something to tell you what already my heart yearns for the message speak do you wish to know what it is yes speak quickly sir pray wait i have almost run myself out of breath do you find any pleasure in keeping me in suspense since you wish to know at once the orders which i have received from this charming person i will tell you upon my word without boasting of my zeal i went a great way to find the lady and if hang your digressions fie you should somewhat moderate your passion and seneca seneca is a fool in your mouth since he tells me nothing of all that concerns me tell me your message at once to satisfy you or feast an insect has got among your hair let it alone this lovely one sends you word what guess are you aware that i am in no laughing mood her message is that you are to remain in this place that in a short time you shall see her here when she has got rid of some country ladies who greatly bore all people at court let us then stay in the place she has selected but since this message affords me some leisure let me muse a little exit la montagne i propose to write for her some verses to an air which i know she likes he walks up and down the stage in a reverie. Scene four, Urant, Climen, and Erast at the side of the stage unseen. Everyone will be of my opinion. Do you think you will carry your point by obstinacy? I think my reasons better than yours. I wish someone could hear both. I see a gentleman here who is not ignorant he will be able to judge of our dispute marquis a word i beg of you allow us to ask you to decide in a quarrel between us two we had a discussion arising from our different opinions as to what may distinguish the most perfect lovers 
that is a question difficult to settle you had best look for a more skilful judge no you speak to no purpose your wit is much commended and we know you we know that every one with justice gives you the character of a oh I, I beseech you in a word you shall be our umpire and you must spare us a couple of minutes Clemen to her aunt now you are retaining one who must condemn you for to be brief if what i venture to hold be true this gentleman will give the victory to my arguments erast aside would that i could get hold of any rascal to invent something to get me off Orant to Climen. for my part i am too much assured of his sense to fear that he will decide against me to erast well this great contest which rages between us is to know whether a lover should be jealous or the better to explain my opinion and yours which ought to please most a jealous man or one that is not so for my part i am clearly for the last as for me i stand up for the first i believe that our heart must declare for him who best displays his respect and i that if our sentiments are to be shown it ought to be for him who makes his love most apparent yes but we perceive the ardour of a lover much better through respect than through jealousy it is my opinion that he who is attached to us loves us the more that he shows himself jealous <laughs> fie clemen do not call lovers those men whose love is like hatred and who instead of showing their respect and their ardour give themselves no thought save how to become wearisome whose minds being ever prompted by some gloomy passion seek to make a crime out of the slightest actions are too blind to believe them innocent and demand an explanation for a glance who if we seem a little sad at once complain that their presence is the cause of it and when the least joy sparkles in our eyes we'll have their rivals to be at the bottom of it who in short assuming a right because they are greatly in love never speak to us save to pick a quarrel there to forbid any one to approach us and become the tyrants of their very conquerors as for me i want lovers to be respectful their submission is a sure proof of our sway fie do not call those men true lovers who are never violent in the passion those lukewarm gallants whose tranquil hearts already think everything quite sure have no fear of losing us and overweeningly suffer their love to slumber day by day are on good terms with their rivals and leave a free field for their perseverance so sedate a love incites my anger to be without jealousy is to love coldly i would that a lover in order to prove his flame should have his mind shaken by eternal suspicions and by sudden outbursts show clearly the value he sets upon her to whose hand he aspires then his restlessness is applauded and if he sometimes treats us a little roughly the pleasure of seeing him penitent at our feet to excuse himself for the outbreak of which he has been guilty his tears his despair at having been capable of displeasing us are a charm to soothe all our anger <laughs> if much violence is necessary to please you i know who would satisfy you i am acquainted with several men in paris who love well enough to beat their fair ones openly if to please you there must never be jealousy i know several men just suited to you lovers of such enduring mood that they would see you in the arms of thirty people without being concerned about it and now you must by your sentence declare whose love appears to you preferable orphise appears at the back of the stage and sees erast between orant and climen since i cannot avoid giving judgment i mean to satisfy you both at once and in order not to blame that which is pleasing in your eyes the jealous man loves more but the other loves wisely the judgment is very judicious but it is enough i have finished after what i have said permit me to leave you scene five orphise erast erast seeing orphise and going to meet her how long you have been madam 
and how i suffer nay nay do not leave such a pleasant conversation you are wrong to blame me for having arrived too late pointing to orant and climen who have just left you had wherewithal to get on without me will you be angry with me without reason and reproach me with what i am made to suffer oh i beseech you stay leave me i beg and hasten to rejoin your company scene six erast alone heaven must bores of both sexes conspire this day to frustrate my dearest wishes but let me follow her in spite of her resistance and make my innocence clear in her eyes scene seven durant erast ah marquis continually we find tedious people interrupting the course of our pleasures you see me enraged on account of a splendid hunt which a booby oh, it is a story i must relate to you i am looking for someone and cannot stay durant retaining him egad i shall tell it you as we go along we were a well-selected company who met yesterday to hunt a stag on purpose we went to sleep on the ground itself that is my dear sir far away in the forest as the chase is my greatest pleasure i wished to do the thing well to go to the wood myself we decided to concentrate our efforts upon a stag which every one said was seven years old but my own opinion was though i did not stop to observe the marks that it was only a stag of the second year we had separated as was necessary into different parties and were hastily breakfasting on some new laid eggs when a regular country gentleman with a long sword proudly mounted on his brood mare which he honoured with the name of his good mare came up to pay us an awkward compliment presenting to us at the same time to increase our vexation a great booby of a son as stupid as his father he styled himself a great sportsman and begged that he might have the pleasure of accompanying us heaven preserve every sensible sportsman when hunting from a fellow who carries a dog's horn which sounds when it ought not from those gentry who followed by ten mangy dogs call them my pack and play the part of wonderful hunters his request granted and his knowledge commended we all of us started the deer within thrice the length of the leash tally-ho the dogs were put on the track of the stag i encouraged them and blew a loud blast my stag emerged from the wood and crossed a pretty wide plain the dogs after him but in such good order that you could have covered them all with one cloak he made for the forest then we slipped the old pick upon him i quickly brought out my sorrow horse you have seen him i think not not seen him the animal is as good as he is beautiful i bought him some days ago from gavot i leave you to think whether that dealer who is such a respect for me would deceive me in such a matter i am satisfied with the horse he never indeed sold a better or a better shaped one the head of a barb with a clear star the neck of a swan slender and very straight no more shoulder than a hair short jointed and full of vivacity in his motion such feet oh, oh by heaven such feet double haunched to tell you the truth it was i alone who found the way to break him in gavot's little john never mounted him without trembling 
though he did his best to look unconcerned, a back that beats any horses for breadth, and legs. Ho, oh, ho, ye heavens! In short, he is a marvel. Believe me, I have refused a hundred pistoles for him, with one of the horses destined for the king to boot. I then mounted and was in high spirits to see some of the hounds coursing over the plain to get the better of the deer i pressed on and found myself in a by thicket at the heels of the dogs with none else but drekar there for an hour our stag was at bay upon this i cheered on the dogs and made a terrible row in short no hunter was ever more delighted i alone started him again and all was going on swimmingly when a young stag joined ours some of my dogs left the others oh, marquis i saw them as you may suppose follow with hesitation and finot was at a loss but he suddenly turned which delighted me very much and drew the dogs the right way whilst I sounded horned and hallooed, Fino, Fino. I again with pleasure discovered the track of the deer by a molehill and blew away at my leisure. A few dogs ran back to me when, as ill luck would have it, the young stag came over to our country bumpkin. My blunderer began blowing like mad and bellowed aloud, Tally-ho, tally-ho tally ho all my dogs left me and made for my booby i hastened there and found the track again on the high road but my dear fellow i had scarcely cast my eyes on the ground when i discovered it was the other animal and was very much annoyed at it it was in vain to point out to the country fellow the difference between the print of my stag's hoof and his he still maintained, like an ignorant sportsman, that this was the pack stag, and by this disagreement he gave the dogs time to get to a great way off. I was in a rage, and heartily cursing the fellow, I spurred my horse up hill and down dale, and brushed through boughs as thick as my arm. I brought back my dogs to my first scent who set off to my great joy in search of our stag as though he were in full view they started him again but did ever such an accident happen to tell you the truth marquis it floored me our stag newly started past our bumpkin who thinking to show what an admirable sportsman he was shot him just in the forehead with a horse pistol that he had brought with him and cried out to me from a distance ah oh, i've brought the beast down good heavens did anyone ever hear of pistols in stag hunting as for me when i came to the spot i found the whole affair so odd that i put spurs to my horse in a rage and returned home at a gallop without saying a single word to that ignorant fool you could not have done better your prudence was admirable that is how we must get rid of boris farewell when you like we will go somewhere where we need not dread country hunters the rost alone very well i think i shall lose patience in the end let me make all haste and try to excuse myself. Ballet to Act Two. First entry. Bowler stop Erast to measure a distance about which there is a dispute. He gets clear of them with difficulty and leaves them to dance a measure composed of all the postures usual to that game. Second entry. Little boys with slings enter and interrupt them, who are in their turn driven out by. Third entry cobblers men and women their fathers and others who are also driven out in their turn fourth entry a gardener who dances alone and then retires end of act two
Act Three of The Boars by Moliere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three Scene One Erast La Montagne. It is true that on the one hand my efforts have succeeded, the object of my love is at length appeased but on the other hand i am wearied the cruel stars have persecuted my passion with double fury yes demi her guardian the worst of bores is again hostile to my tenderest desires has forbidden me to see his lovely niece and wishes to provide her tomorrow with another husband yet our feast in spite of his refusal deigns to grant me this evening a favour I have prevailed upon the fair one to suffer me to see her in her own house, in private. Love prefers above all secret favours. It finds a pleasure in the obstacle which it masters. The slightest conversation with the beloved beauty becomes, when it is forbidden, a supreme favour. I am going to the rendezvous. It is almost the hour, since I wish to be there rather before than after my time. Shall I follow you? No. I fear lest you should make me known to certain suspicious persons. But— I do not desire it. I must obey you. But at least, if at a distance— For the twentieth time will you hold your tongue? And will you never give up this practice of perpetually making yourself a troublesome servant? Scene 2. Caritides, Erast. Sir, it is an unseasonable time to do myself the honour of waiting upon you. Morning would be more fit for performing such a duty, but it is not very easy to meet you, for you are always asleep or in town. At least your servants so assure me. I have chosen this opportunity to see you, and yet this is a great happiness with which fortune favours me, for a couple of moments later I should have missed you sir do you desire something of me i quit myself sir of what i owe you and come to you excuse the boldness which inspires me without so much ceremony what have you to say to me as the rank wit and generosity which every one extols in you yes i am very much extolled never mind that sir sir it is a vast difficulty when a man has to introduce himself we should always be presented to the great by people who commend us in words whose voice being listened to delivers with authority what may cause our slender merit to be known in short i could have wished that some persons well informed could have told you sir what i am i see sufficiently sir what you are your manner of accosting me makes that clear yes i am a man of learning charmed by your worth but one of those learned men whose names end simply in us nothing is so common as a name with a latin termination those we dress in greek have a much superior look and in order to have one ending in east i call myself mr caridides caritide be it what have you to say I wish, sir, to read you a petition which I venture to beg of you to present to the king as your position enables you to do. Why, sir? You can present it yourself. It is true that the king grants that supreme favor, but from the very excess of his rare kindness, so many villainous petitions, sir, are presented that they choke the good ones. The hope I entertain is that mine should be presented when his majesty is alone well you can do it and choose your own time ah sir the doorkeepers are such terrible fellows they treat men of learning like snobs and butts i can never get beyond the guard-room the ill-treatment i am compelled to suffer would make me withdraw from court for ever if i had not conceived with certain hope that you will be my mycenaeus with the king yes uh, your influence is to me a certain means well then give it me i will present it here it is but at least hear it read no that you may be acquainted with it sir i beg to the king sire 
your most humble most obedient most faithful and most learned a subject and servant Charidides, a frenchman by birth a greek by profession having considered the great and notable abuses which are perpetrated in the inscriptions on the signs of the houses shops taverns bowling alleys and other places in your good city of paris inasmuch as certain ignorant composers of the said inscriptions subvert by a barbarous pernicious and hateful spelling every kind of sense and reason without any regard for etymology analogy energy or allegory whatsoever to the great scandal of the republic of letters and of the french nation which is degraded and dishonoured by the said abuses and gross faults in the eyes of strangers and notably of germans curious readers and inspectors of the said inscriptions this petition is very long and may very likely weary ah oh, sir not a word could be cut out finish quickly humbly petitions your majesty to constitute for the good of his state and the glory of his realm an office of controller supervisor corrector reviser and restorer in general of the said inscriptions and with this office to honour your suppliant as well as in consideration of his rare and eminent erudition as of the great and signal services which he has rendered to the state and to your majesty by making the anagram of your said majesty in french latin greek hebrew syriac chaldean arabic very good give it me quickly and retire it shall be seen by the king the thing is as good as done alas sir to show my petition is everything if the king but see it i am sure of my point for as his justice is great in all things he will never be able to refuse my prayer for the rest to raise your fame to the skies give me your name and surname in writing and i will make a poem in which the first letters of your name shall appear at both ends of the line and in each half measure yes you shall have it tomorrow, Mr. Caratide. Alone. Upon my word, such learned men are perfect asses. Another time I should have heartily laughed at his folly. Scene three. Orma, Erast. Though a matter of great consequence brings me here, I wished that man to leave before speaking to you. Very well. But make haste for I wish to be gone. I almost fancy that the man who has just left you has vastly annoyed you, sir, by his visit. He is a troublesome old man, whose mind is not quite right, and for whom I have always some excuse ready to get rid of him. On the Mall, in the Luxembourg, and in the Tuileries, he wearies people with his fancies. Men like you should avoid the conversation of all those good-for-nothing pedants. For my part, I have no fear of troubling you, since I am come, sir, to make your fortune. Erast, aside. This is some alchemist, one of those creatures who have nothing, and are always promising you ever so much riches. Aloud. Have you discovered that blessed stone, sir, which alone can enrich all the kings of the earth? Aha! What a funny idea! Heaven forbid, sir, that I should be one of those fools i do not foster idle dreams i bring you here sound words of advice which i would communicate through you to the king and which i always carry about me sealed up none of those silly plans and vain chimeras which are dinned in the ears of our superintendents none of your beggarly schemes which rise to no more than twenty or thirty millions but one which at the lowest reckoning will give the king around four hundred millions yearly, with ease, without risk or suspicion, without oppressing the nation in any way. In short, it is a scheme for an inconceivable profit, which will be found feasible at the first explanation. Yes, if only through you I can be encouraged. Well, we will talk of it. I am rather in a hurry if you will promise to keep it a secret i will unfold to you this important scheme no no i do not wish to know your secret sir i believe you are too discreet to divulge it and i wish to communicate it to you frankly in two words i must see that no one can hear us 
after seeing that no one is listening, he approaches Arast's ear. This marvelous plan, of which I am the inventor, is... A little farther off, sir, for a certain reason. You know, without any need of my telling you, the great profit which the king yearly receives from his seaports. Well, the plan of which no one has yet thought, and which is an easy matter, is to make all the coasts of France into famous ports. This would amount to vast sums, and if... The scheme is good, and will greatly please the king. Farewell. We shall see each other again. At all events, assist me, for you are the first to whom I have spoken of it. Yes, yes. If you would lend me a couple of pistols, you could repay yourself out of the profits of the scheme. Arast gives money to Orma. Gladly. Alone. Would to heaven that at such a price I could get rid of all who trouble me. How ill-timed their visit is. At last I think I may go. Will anyone else come to detain me? Scene 4. Felin Erast. Marquis, I have just heard strange tidings. What? That someone has just now quarreled with you. With me? What is the use of dissimulation? I know on good authority that you have been called out, and as your friend, I come, at all events, to offer you my services against all mankind. I am obliged to you, but believe me, you do me... You will not admit it, but you are going out without attendance. Stay in town or go into the country. You shall go nowhere without my accompanying you. Erast, aside. Oh, I shall go mad. Where is the use of hiding from me? I swear to you, Marquis, that you have been deceived. It is no use denying it. May heaven smite me if any dispute. Do you think I believe you? Good heaven, I tell you without concealment that... Do not think me such a dupe and simpleton. Will you oblige me? No. Leave me, I pray. Nothing of the sort, Marquis. An assignation tonight at a certain place. I do not quit you. Wherever it be, I mean to follow you. On my soul, since you mean me to have a quarrel, I agree to it to satisfy your zeal. I shall be with you, who put me in a rage and of whom I cannot get rid by fair means. That is a sorry way of receiving the service of a friend. But as I do you so ill an office, farewell. Finish what you have on hand without me. You will be my friend when you leave me. Alone. But see what misfortunes happen to me. They will have made me miss the hour appointed. Scene 5. Damis, Lapine, Erast, La Riviere, and his companions. Damis, aside. What? The rascal hopes to obtain her in spite of me? Ugh! My just wrath shall know how to prevent him. Erast, aside. I see someone there at Orphise's door. What? Must there always be some obstacle to the passion she sanctions? Damis, to Lepine. Yes, I have discovered that my niece in spite of my care, is to receive Erast in her room tonight, alone. La Riviere to his companions. What do I hear those people saying of our master? Let us approach safely without betraying ourselves. Damis to Lepine. But before he has a chance of accomplishing his design, we must pierce his treacherous heart with a thousand blows. Go and fetch those whom I mentioned just now, and place them in ambush where I told you, so that at the name of Erast they may be ready to avenge my honour, which his passion has the presumption to outrage, to break off the assignation which brings him here, and quench his guilty flame in his blood. La Riviere attacking Damis with his companions. Before your fury can destroy him, wretch, you shall have to deal with us. Though he would have killed me, honor urges me here to rescue the uncle of my mistress. To Damis. I am on your side, sir. He draws his sword and attacks La Riviere and his companions, whom he puts to flight. Heavens! By whose aid do I find myself saved from a certain death? To whom am I indebted for so rare a service? Arast, returning. 
in serving you i have done but an act of justice heavens can i believe my ears is this the hand of erast yes yes sir it is i too happy that my hand has rescued you too unhappy in having deserved your hatred what erast whom i was resolved to have assassinated has just used his sword to defend me oh this is too much my heart is compelled to yield whatever your love may have meditated to-night this remarkable display of generosity ought to stifle all animosity i blush for my crime and blame my prejudice my hatred has too long done you injustice to show you openly i no longer entertain it i unite you this very night to your love scene six orphes damis erast orphes entering with a silver candlestick in her hand sir what has happened that such a terrible disturbance niece nothing but what is very agreeable since after having blamed for a long time your love for erast i now give him to you for a husband his arm has warded off the deadly thrust aimed at me i desire that your hand reward him i owe everything to you if therefore it is to pay him your debt i consent as he has saved your life my heart is so overwhelmed by this great miracle that amidst this ecstasy i doubt if i am awake let us celebrate the happy lot that awaits you and let our violins put us in a joyful mood as the violins strike up there is a knock at the door who knocks so loud scene seven damis orphes erast lepine sir here are masks with kits and tabors the masks enter filling the stage what bores forever hello god's there turn out these rascals for me ballet to act three first entry swiss guards with halberds drive out all the troublesome masks and then retire to make room for a dance of second entry four shepherds and a shepherdess who in the opinion of all who saw it concluded the entertainment with much grace end of act three end of the boars by moliere